Okay, welcome everyone. Thanks for joining me while we talk about closing valves the right way with AFT Impulse. Uh, if you're joining me live, thank you. I appreciate the live audience, love that. But of course, if you're watching the recording, also love that because it's good content regardless. So this webinar is really about simulating surge from valve closures using our software tool, AFT Impulse. My name is Walt and I am your host today. I do things at AFT, a bunch of it. So um, let's just jump in. I don't think you care too much about me, but more about the content. Of course, though, we can't jump straight in because we have to talk about safety. I have been working on uh, finishing our basement recently. So I've gotten into a lot of plumbing, fits on today's topic, but go slow when closing or opening your water shutoff valves at home. Home. So whenever you're shutting off the main water, do it close, uh, do it slowly. And when you're opening it, that's a little more important. Do that slowly because you get a rush of flow and pressure into your pipes, causing water hammer. Awesome for learning about water hammer. But there are better ways to learn about it, like webinars such as these. Okay, so we're gonna go through some of the basics of water hammer research, depending on where you are, you might use different terminology, but it's all about the, uh, the same thing, right? Stopping flow and causing pressure rise. We'll do it from the perspective of valve closures because um, that's the most common kind of analysis people do, but it's not the only concern you should worry about with surge. There are other things like pump trips, um, and these low pressure transients that you should worry about. But today we'll focus on valves. With that, we have to talk a little bit about valve characteristics. There is a webinar coming up or already recorded. If you're watching this recording, it's probably already out there. A webinar specifically on valve characteristics, really zooming into that topic. But we'll go over a little bit of it today. Then we're gonna jump into the software to look at a simplified valve closure case, an impulse where we will compare results from different closures, and different ways of closing the valve, all within one model. Then we will move into a more complex uh, valve closure um, case with impulse where we're looking at a pipeline. It's more complex because we're going to tie a few transient events together to simulate this control logic. That'll be more apparent when we jump into it. And we're going to learn about meeting ASME B31.4. That's right. So taking a step back, let's look at the fundamental principles of water hammer, or it really comes down to the conservation of energy. So here we have a moving car suddenly being stopped by a wall. And all of that velocity, all of that kinetic energy has to go somewhere. So it's converted into a potential energy. In this case, what it's doing is crumpling the car and causing it to bounce up and down a bit. So it's the same idea with fluids. You suddenly stop a flow, that velocity gets converted into potential energy in the form of pressure and propagates through your system and goes through this wave cycle. So in order to mitigate that, to try to prevent this bad behavior, what if, in this analogy, the car wasn't going as quickly to begin with? It would be less harmful to the passengers. Or what if the driver braked in stages where instead of suddenly being stopped by a wall, that's you know an awfully rough way to brake, brake slowly over time and come to a smooth halt, right? It wouldn't be as dramatic. So that's just kind of an analogy. Now we'll look at more the um, equation side from fluids. So there's this equation known as the Joukowsky equation, which is a theoretical equation that describes the pressure rise that comes from stopping a fluid instantaneously. So instantaneously is off, you know, um, not necessarily realistic and considered the conservative way to account for pressure rise. Typically, that's at least what people think. So it describes pressure rise on this left side as a function of density, fluid density, fluid wave speed and the uh, velocity change. So there is this negative sign in front because when you drop velocity, you 
want you are increasing in pressure so the negative sign just kind of um, make sure that that rule is followed that dropping velocity increases pressure all right so what does this mean a denser fluid leads to higher pressures higher wave speed leads to higher pressures and higher starting velocity leads to higher pressures so when you're moving faster and you stop you get that increase more dramatically now i said this is a theoretical equation that describes an instantaneous pressure wave because um, because it's instantaneous people think that is conservative but it's not actually always conservative because there are things to consider outside of that localized point for that pressurized so actually let me take a step back this equation is a theoretical um, equation it's true but you have to understand what it means and it, it is talking about a very specific point in space like right at the closed valve you see a pressure spike but things happen after that point in time and in space that you have to account for so what can happen at a different point in space such as after the valve is you have transient cavitation so that's what we call it or you might know it as liquid column separation so that's something a Joukowsky equation want to predict or later in time maybe as waves propagate back and forth and you go through a wave cycle you land on low pressures that drop below vapor pressure and you uh, vaporize your fluid right you have the effect of line pack which is in a long pipeline you have a bunch of frictional pressure loss frictional pressure loss only comes from a moving fluid so if that fluid is no longer moving you get frictional recovery so all of that pressure that was lost to friction is now gained on top of the Joukowsky pressure rise so you've got a twofer you've got the pressure rise from suddenly closing a valve but then you have a slow buildup of another pressure rise from frictional recovery that's known as line back you have interacting pressure waves you have pipe size changes where that changes the velocity and that generates new you know pressure waves moving through so the point is using a simplified equation pinpointed to a certain point in space and a certain point in time does not tell the whole story because you have to look at the model holistically so what do now bring in aft impulse of course got to simulate that's what we do that's what our software does that's how you can account for all of these different things okay so that was the basics of water hammer um, mostly from the perspective of closing a valve right stopping this velocity well with valves there's more nuance to them than just stopping the flow every kind of valve stops flow differently and it's important to capture that nuance within a simulation software and what we call that our valve characteristics so what we're looking at here is a graph containing different types of valves just common types obviously there are many 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 types and yours specifically you know might not fall exactly into these categories but these are just examples where on the left side we have effectively valve cb that's a flow coefficient so it describes how much flow um, is moving through the valve with certain pressure drop so just think of this as allowed flow right so the lower the number the lower the flow the higher the number the higher the flow and it's percent of max to non-dimensionalize it over on this x-axis here we have valve position or percent open uh, that's the terminology we use in impulse is how open is it so at a hundred percent open that's going to be where the most flow moves through the valve right and you can't go above a hundred percent open because then you just have a different hundred percent every kind of valve will control flow differently so in this case let's look at the ball valve which is a red line this red line here at 100% open, it has you know, the maximum flow allowed. And as you start to close the ball valve, it restricts flow fairly quickly. At least that's what this graph indicates, right? It restricts flow to 50% you know, of its max when it's only 85% open or 15% closed. So it controls it quickly and then it uh, diminishes down to zero and it makes sense for a ball valve if you can imagine 
where there might not be a lot of pressure loss during steady flow, you start to close it, that valve is uh, blocking flow perpendicularly and it will restrict it really quickly. So it's all about the physics of the valve uh, or like the, the shape of it and how flow is moving through it, how torturous the path is that uh, defines these characteristic curves. So the point being, not all valves control flow equally. Not all valves are created equal. So if, you, if we're looking at valve closures where we're going from 100% open to zero, we want to capture these profiles. So again, th there's another webinar on that uh, coming up or uh, recently recorded if you're watching the recording. Okay. But just understand that we want to capture the controlling behavior of the valve. Awesome. So without further ado, let's just jump into the software. So what we're going to look at so we have an example case here, what I'm calling a simplified case, where we have water flowing from one reservoir, a high reservoir, down to two different tanks. Okay, it is not a uh, pressurized system with a pump, but is we are assuming it is liquid full, and it's just being driven by an elevation difference. All right. So what we want to look at, so. Uh, when we're doing transient analysis, it's always important for you as the user to be like, okay, what am I going to tell Impulse to do? What is the transient thing happening? And in this case, the transient thing happening that I am going to put on the Impulse is closing this valve. And ultimately, it depends on the study you're doing or why you are doing the analysis, but you have to define some sort of initiating event. So me, as a user, I am deciding I'm closing valve one, and I want to see what happens. What happens to the rest of my system? And also, are there better ways to close the valve than what I might initially think? Okay. We'll move over to uh, our uh, impulse model. I have it pulled up here. So I have already built the model. I am doing this webinar, assuming you have at least some familiarity with our software, uh, hopefully, you know, a little bit more than just a beginner level because I, I move quickly. But if not, it's okay. Don't worry too much about exactly how I did it. I do want to show you how, but if you, if you don't have that much experience, just know that it can. That's uh, really the important part, that you can do these things. So anyway, I built a model. I have to define my boundaries. So I have one reservoir going to two other tanks, water being the, the working fluid, and I want to start now my simulation. Before I jump into any transients, and this is true with any um, system you want to work with, is run it in your normal steady state operating, operating conditions to make sure ro results are reasonable because you might have something to run in steady state to make sure you get what you expected. How I would do that in impulse analysis setup is how you define almost everything about the model other than uh, pipe and, and junction information. I can go to transient control, simulation mode. I'm doing steady only. So it ignores all the rest of the transient information. And again, this webinar is not so much about defining the transient setting so much as just showing you uh, valve closure stuff because there's just too much to talk about, right? So. Right now, we're just doing steady state. I run the model. Okay, I get, and I can look at my output. My flow rates seem reasonable. Right, I have about 1500 GPM moving through there, velocity of nine. And then when the flow splits, velocity drop because there's a flow split to about eight. I mean, it's somewhat high, but not terribly high. Gives me a good starting point of where we're, um, you know, where we're starting at to then trigger the transient. So with that steady state result, I can look at a pressure profile just to see what's going on. So what we have here is uh, some length of pipe, 500 feet. It is dropping in pressure from the flow, even though it's also dropping in elevation, the frictional loss is dominant in this case. Then the flow splits, which is why you see a sudden drop in velocity. Because oh, when I'm looking at a profile graph, I forgot to mention, what I'm looking at are these pipes and this pipe. I'm ignoring the bottom part. So this is just what I call the tile. So as soon as it gets to J4, we would expect a lower flow, right? Lower velocity, which is what we see. Then 
Uh, it continues to drop in elevation, but in this case, the frictional loss isn't dominating, but just the drop in the elevation is, which is raising my pressure. Then I go back to my output. So um, this is just describing my steady state pressure profile of the system so I can get a good baseline. My maximum steady state pressure is at about, I don't know, 10 pounds or so. So seems very reasonable, perfect, things are looking good. Now let's trigger that transient. So what I would do, or what I did and what you should do as a user is create another scenario, a separate instance of this model, a carbon copy of it, and then make your changes there. I would do that right click, um, create child right here, right? So now I do want to go into transient mode. So in analysis setup, I would go to the same setting, transient control and move to transient. Now I get to define everything. Again, I'm not gonna go too far in depth with sectioning and all that. There are other webinars that do that, but you do need to understand we are looking at this system now for 10 seconds. It didn't matter in the steady state case because steady state is steady. No matter when you look at it, it's the same answer. In a transient, things change. The when does matter. So when I'm saying I'm running a simulation for 10 seconds, that is like me in the field looking at the system for 10 seconds doing this valve closure. It is the observation time, not how long it takes to run the model and do the math. It's just think of it as observation time. And to me, 10 seconds is good enough for this simulation because I know the pressure waves are gonna dampen out after some time, no need to prolong it. So everything else, um, sorry, all of the other boundaries and most pipe and valve information is the same. The difference is you now see a T next to this valve because I'm defining a transient with it. So when I go into the valve definition, my steady state flow coefficient was 1000, caused a little bit of pressure drop, not much, but that was a starting CV. Cool. Now that we're in transient mode where things are changing with time, I am going to as a user input information on how to close this valve. Because again, not being steady state anymore, it's going to change. So I define my information based on time, just at time zero, I'm gonna start stuff. You can just think of it that way. And I'm just going to manually input a starting CV of a thousand, because that was my steady state, down to zero. So this is not capturing the nuance. Of valve characteristics. This is a simplified case where I am just, just assuming a linear drop in flow from 1000 to zero. So uh, this graph is not awesome, but that's because it's such a short time frame. You can see I'm dropping it in 0 0.1 seconds. That's a tenth of a second. I'm going from fully open to closed. So a tenth of a second is my approximation of instantaneous. I could go even more finer than that, but it's good enough for this example. Um, you'll also notice that I don't just go uh, from zero to a tenth of a second. I'm I'm closing it at two seconds. And the reason for this, I got a tip from a colleague who helped me out with that, um, is that if I'm comparing to other closure times, it helps to overlay the graphs and to compare things more directly if they all, all have the same closure time, the time that they're actually closed instead of the same starting time. So each one of these scenarios will uh, close at two seconds. The difference is when the closure really starts. So it starts a tenth of a second before. So anyway, this is a very fast valve closure. I've defined my transient information, cool. I can run the model, which I already have, and then I can see um, some output. Something that's useful at a glance for engineers is if you go to output general, you can see scroll all the way down, uh, maximum steady state pressure and a maximum transient pressure. So let's take a second to look at these two, okay? My maximum steady state was about 10, as we said before, and now it's about 480 during the transient. That's a huge jump, that is um, massive. So rather than just staring at tabular data though, I'm gonna uh, heavily rely on graphs to see what's going on. So the third, first thing I want to do is I want to look at my profile, profile graph. So what I'm looking at here is 
this is this was the same steady state profile that I had in my original scenario, but you can see the scale of my axes are very different. Instead of having a max of 10, it has a max of 500. So if I were to zoom in, you would see that same pressure profile we had before, but you're already getting a sneak peek that it doesn't stay there, right? During the transient, something happens. And I want to demonstrate that with a little animation. So what I can do and what you can do with impulse is look at a profile which has some parameter tracked with length as the x-axis, as the independent variable length, but transients have this third dimension now of time. So the way this graph is going to work is it is going to animate through time, through each time step, and you will see um, this effectively represents my piping, and then each time step something new will happen, and that's the third dimension of time. So I want to kind of zoom into about 1.8 seconds where my uh, transients uh, start because it doesn't really start closing until about 1.9 and I can play this. And hopefully it's not too fast, there we go. So what we're seeing here is this was my steady state profile. Oh, all of a sudden my valve is closed. Boom, you see a giant spike in pressure. And then on the other side of the valve, there is a low pressure wave moving through. And I can do this slowly and just step it through time where, oh, this is my pressure wave now propagating through the rest of the system. It's moving pretty slowly. I can speed it up if I really want, and then it looks quite chaotic. Um, but these things happen on a very short time scale, right? So that's why it looks this way. So um, the point of that was to see, okay, cool. So the valve does close at that time. That's where I'm seeing this huge pressure spike is at the valve. So what I want to do is zoom in. No longer is my x-axis going to be length, but my x-axis is going to be time at a single point in space. So the single point is a valve. It is the, um, in this case right now, the inlet of the valve, which is right here, right? Right at the end of pipe 102. A single point in space, but the pressure tracked with time. So this one is a 2D graph as opposed to that 3D graph we saw with the animation. Um, you just kind of got to wrap your mind around the axis difference. <clears throat> so here we see the pressure, the valve spiking to that maximum of about 480, right? And that's right once the valve closes at two seconds, then it bounces around through the system, comes back and slowly diminishes as we would expect to a new steady state. That's awesome. But if you, um, only look at the upstream part of the valve, you miss some of the story. And you probably already saw a little sneak preview of the outlet of the valve, which was this blue graph. So now we're looking at the uh, downstream side of this valve on the other side of it. It's pressure response through time. Why does it also have pressure spikes? That's quite odd because it happens delayed. It happens after the valve has closed. And in this time scale, a relatively long time after the valve has closed. That's half a second, you know, when the valve only closed in 0.1 seconds. Where is this pressure spike coming from? It's not as high, so it didn't, it wasn't flagged as my maximum, but it's still kind of concerning. And what is going on here is one of those effects um, we talked about where J Joukowsky just won't capture this, is there is actually um, transient cavitation happening after the valve because it's such a sudden closure, you have a sudden pressure spike, but you have a sudden pressure drop on the downstream side that drops, in this case, below vapor pressure and causes vapor formation. So now this is another graph we can look at. By the way, I've saved all these graphs uh, beforehand, but you can do this too within your own models. It's just being able to reload them with each scenario and each thing. You just have to define them first and save them. Okay, so. Um, Again, not trying to show you how to do this, just what we can observe and what we can look at with the tool of AFT Impulse. So what we're seeing after the valve is we have vapor formation, in this case, fairly significant, huge. I would say we can't really trust these um, results quantitatively, but you can certainly trust them qualitatively because you know you're gonna have major problems when you have um, such liquid column separation. So it, this vapor pocket forms just after the valve, you know, over 
uh, over that half a second. And then what happens? Oh, that bad boy collapses. Vapor collapse is bad. Vape, well, negative pressures in pipes is bad, but vapor collapse is bad because that leads to, yes, pressure spikes. It's like steady state cavitation in a pump. It's not the vapor that's the problem necessarily. It's the pitting and the collapse of the vapor pocket that's the problem. So although it wasn't as high of a pressure spike as the um, upstream side of the valve, it's still concerning. And anytime you have negative pressures in a pipe, it's not good. So cool. We have determined this is not good. What can we do about it? There are many ways to mitigate water hammer in these high pressures with equipment um, or just by better actuation of the valve. So that's what today we're talking about, right? Instead of looking at like surge vessels or what have you, or relief valves, um, vacuum breakers, we are just going to look at how can we just better close the valve? That's the simplest solution. So, um, that was the most simple case of defining the valve. What now I've done with another child scenario is I've put in some valve characteristics. <clears throat> so what that what that means is the valve is pretty much defined the same way. It has a starting CV. Cool. But now in my optional tab, I have actually defined this valve with the um, impulse template of a globe valve. So just by knowing a maximum CV, I can actually generate these valve characteristic curves from impulse. Your valves are going to be awfully specific, though. This is more if you have nothing, it's better than nothing if you know the type of valve. But if you have actual data, you can import from a CSV, probably the most common thing, import from a CSV, this information about valve position versus CV and create your own characteristic curve right from a manufacturer and the way that i would that i did this without a manufacturer just using the impulse um, templates was i created the cv versus open percent defined and predefined i i know my fully open cv i'm just assuming this valve is 100 percent open it's probably not realistic because you don't want to operate with all valves 100 percent open but it was just a simplified case so what all that means is it knows that at 100% open, I'm at 1,000 CV because that was how I defined it. And then it fills in the rest as a globe valve. It knows that, right? And I transfer it, put it in there. Now, closing the valve is not linear with CV. It's linear with open percent. But again, that's nonlinear with flow control. So the way I would do that in the transient was in a very similar way. I at time zero, I'm at 100% open, and I start closing at 1.9 seconds to capture that tenth of a second closure. The major difference here is that I am defining it based on percent open instead of an absolute CV. What this does is it simplifies my input tremendously because I'm just saying I'm going from 100 to zero in 0.1 seconds. This is a linear actuation. I'm linearly closing the valve but that's not linearly controlling the flow because by um, matching a percent open with the CV, it's capturing the nuances of a closing valve that's more realistic. And the way I did that was just instead of absolute values of CV, this would have been a thousand, was open percentage, a thousand to zero. And we'll see that um, results change a bit. In this case, they don't change that much. I just wanted to show you how you can put them in, what it looks like, is now, if I look at, remember my extreme case was just upstream of the valve. It was at about a pressure of 480, and now we're at about 470. I would say those results are not that much different, and you'd want to do sensitivity anyway, because there's a lot of uncertainty in models. Um, but according to these results, I mean, it's closer to about 15 pounds between the previous scenario and this one. and our steady state operating pressure was 10 pounds. So just the difference between the models is larger than our steady state operating pressures. But including the valve uh, characteristics change results a bit, but not enough to say, oh, well, this is an okay valve closure. There's clearly still a problem with this valve closure. And you can see that again with vapor formation. It still occurs, even though I've captured some more realistic 
uh, valve properties. The rest of my scenarios assume the same characteristics. The difference is, you can probably see by the time, is that instead of closing in a tenth of a second, I am changing the closure. I'm going to 0.5, half a second. I'm going up to one second. I'm going up to two seconds. So the only difference between these scenarios is this time right here. I'm going from one second to two seconds, 100% to zero. That's a one second closure. And similarly with the other times. I can actually look at this pretty uh, quickly with a scenario comparison tool. Where that was, tool scenario comparison. I just choose the scenarios I want to compare. Oh, I need to do that. Tool scenario comparison tool. Okay. What I want to do is just show the differences. And we can see, oh, cool. So the only thing different between these four scenarios are that uh, are my transient data. So it doesn't tell you exactly, but we know it's just the timing that's different. Cool. So after we run all these models, we can similarly look at the profiles, look at the um, pressure responses and all of that. But what's especially cool with software is you can overlay all of those scenarios on one graph. So what I want to do, and that's what we call a multi-scenario graph, is I am looking at all four of these scenarios at once to directly compare them. Again, making heavy use of graphs because it's easier to see things. So here is a graph of my pressure response just upstream of my valve um, being tracked over time. So here was that 470-ish uh, pound pressure spike. Cool. That was on my fastest valve closure. And as you might have guessed, hey, if I close my valve slower, maybe things work out better. And yes, in this case, it does. It does not always. But in this case, it does. Going from one second to half a second drops my pressure rise uh, by more than half, right? So that is significant. And then we keep, it keeps dropping down. And I can even zoom in. Let's see if I zoom in here. Uh, just to get a little better scale for the graph. So again, 470 to about you know, 190, 200, to 100, to a very small pressure spike of 40, relatively small, again, of course, compared to the steady state of 10, uh, 40 pounds of pressure rises. Still significant, but it's not as crazy as the other cases. So we can see all of this at a glance, this is all just the upstream. Now let's look at the downstream, where we were concerned about this vapor formation. So here we have significant vapor when it's fast, less vapor when it's less fast, all the way down to no vapor formation when it's a slow enough closure for this system. So now as an operator or someone who is maybe uh, suggesting operation for the system as a consultant or what have you, you can tell them, hey, you need to make sure to close this valve two seconds, uh, probably no faster. You can obviously test more finer resolution if you wanted, like one and a half seconds um, and get really particular. But what you know now is you have more of a quali uh, quantitative and qualitative understanding of uh, how fast to close this valve and in what way, you know. Close it. It is a globe valve, isolation valve. We're going to move flow to uh, one of the other sides. It's fairly realistic with valve characteristics. And the best case scenario is when we close it slower. Okay. So what did we see with that case specifically? You can test these different things within one model file and then overlay results. We call those scenarios, right? Here were the results. We didn't go too in depth with uh, these bottom three, but what did happen is that we saw uh, maximum pressure is actually downstream of the valve because of vapor collapse. It still wasn't higher than our 0.1 second case, but all of these happened downstream of the valve. And why did that happen? Because of transient cavitation or liquid column separation, right? And that's just, that's not good for any pipe because it doesn't like negative pressures, but it also doesn't like vapor collapse. So in this case, what do we know? Slower is better. You can go from 470 pounds pressurized to 45 pounds of pressurized. Which one's better? You be the judge. <laughs>
So here's that graph we looked at again, comparing the four scenarios, just upstream of the valve, and then here looking at downstream of the valve, right? So there's no pressure spike from vapor collapse when it's a two second closure. Cool, hopefully you're tracking with me. I'm not boring you too much, because now we're gonna get into a complex example. More complex, I shouldn't say it's complex, but more complex. What we have here is an oil pipeline with pump stations and long sections of pipe, relatively long. So here we have a five mile pipeline booster station and three mile pipeline to some delivery point. We want to test what happens when we close this valve. How can we safely close this valve uh, to prevent surge and to meet code, right? So um, as part of this, we're going to test closing the valve and tripping the pumps off with the valve because you we want to prevent deadheading the pumps against uh, you know a no flow case and this is that control logic that impulse can handle the point is less so about um, defining the pumps and how they trip so much as just understand that they can be tied to the valve and trip off when some other setting is met so we have a pipeline the reason this case is different is we have a lot more flow a lot longer of a pipeline um, there is specific ASME code for this, B314, that talks about pipelines, and that we can't go above a uh, certain pressure, right? So let's bring up that model. Oh, just started arrow up. Okay, there it is. Sorry, I'm gonna have to wait for that to load for a sec. Okay, so, but anyway, in the background, you can see uh, my pipeline is just as I defined um, on that PowerPoint. Forgive me, this is what happens when you have uh, icons down in your taskbar. Okay, so define as uh, we saw on the PowerPoint, miles of pipeline. What is different is in between these long pipelines, I have uh, this uh, pump piping. This pump piping is relatively small compared to miles of pipeline, right? So originally I simplified the case to where each one of these pipes is 10 feet in length compared to a five mile pipeline is very small. And that's just the way I started this, um, this model, okay? So in a similar way to that previous one, I wanna make sure I'm in steady state. I wanna look at normal operation. What does my normal operation look like? Normal operation looks pretty good. No complaints here. We have a good amount of pressure drop from a long pipeline. Oh, booster pump. Okay, now we're dropping again to our delivery. What is happening in here? This is our flow rate graph. Um, we have sudden drops in flow rate because there's parallel flow splits. So where flow is being taken off, uh, that that is represented by this drop here, but you can see how tiny that length of pipe is compared to, again, miles of pipeline. But point here, okay, no errors, flow, late, uh, flow rates look reasonable, velocities look reasonable, okay. Um, it's a system I can trust, now I can run a transient. The thing is, you should understand that when running a trans transient analysis, there are things like sectioning you have to worry about where it cuts the pipe into multiple sections to track how that pressure wave will flow through the pipe that has to section it up. So it's a really bad idea to put very short sections of pipe. So in this case, 10 feet of pipe next to five miles because that makes sectioning very difficult. And let's just see what it looks like when I run the model. So I don't know, maybe we'll be done in about two years and then it'll converge. No, I'm just kidding, it takes eight minutes. But the point is, I don't wanna run a simulation for eight minutes, so what if instead I put that piping at 100 feet of piping instead of 10 feet, where now all of this pump piping is 100 feet? That sounds fairly significant to you. Going from 10 feet to 100 is no small step, but it is a small step when you're dealing with miles of pipeline. So although I've, shifted the pipe lengths to something that's not quite real, um, totally representative of the system, the results can still be realistic because um, I've run this st new steady state to test it 
I don't want, I don't always just ch change lengths willy nilly. You have to do it and then test it, make sure it's okay. But in this case, pretty much nothing is different about my results. I'm at the same pressures. My flow rate is within 0.1% of the other one. So that's certainly within engineering tolerance. The difference is, oh, it looks like we got a little more length here. But again, compared to miles, uh, that's nothing. So here are those profiles side by side, where the only difference is you just see a little more gap here because it's longer length. But flow rates are the exact same. Pressures are the exact same. It's a little tip if you are worried about pipelines, especially pipelines, because they have you know longer sections of pipe. But if you're curious, the difference was when it was 10 feet of pump piping, it was 2712 gallons per minute. Now it's 2709. So three gallons per minute difference, again, 0.1%, definitely within engineering tolerance. Um, and that makes sense. It's a little lower because there's a little more resistance from a longer pipe, but again, not concerning. So now that I've calibrated my model through the steady state um, and something that's going to be reasonable, I can now do my transient. So I didn't, I didn't describe it when I was doing that 10-foot example, um, just because the point there was more about sectioning. But the transient as a user, I am, what am I defining? I'm defining this valve closing over time. So this case, I call a bad valve closure. Let's look at what I call a bad valve closure. Is I have, again, valve characteristics. What that is, this time not a globe valve, a ball valve, an emergency shutdown ball valve, where I am going to turn it a quarter, and it's going to stop the flow. But I don't wanna do it too quickly, right? Because that causes a lot of surge. But anyway, I'm capturing the characteristics of a ball valve going from 100% open to 0% open in five seconds. Cool. Now, the pumps, I want to make sure to trip off because I don't want a deadhead. So the way that works is in a pump, I have a similar transient tab. Way too much to talk about with pumps, but effectively what I'm doing is I'm saying pumps trip off when my valve open percent is less than 50. That's a little soon. You know, you're probably not doing that, but hey, I wanted to be safe. I want to make sure that if it's closing even a bit because it's only an emergency valve, let's just shut off the pump so it's not pumping for longer than it needs to, right? Because if it's closing, I'm probably going to close all the way. Anyway, the pumps will trip off with that valve, and I do that based on a single event. Okay, you can go back through this webinar, pause, and kind of try to track back to figure out how I did this, but I got to keep things moving. Just know it does stop with the valve. Okay, run the simulation. Oh, I forgot to mention we're running this for 120 seconds. So again, this is observation time. I'm looking at my pipeline for two minutes to see what happens. It is much longer because I know that with this long pipeline, there's long communication times, things take a lot longer to get back and forth um, from one end of the model to the other end of the model. But I, I extended this much further out to, um, to make sure I capture it all, right? And my steady state operating pressure is about 570 pounds, depending on where we are, we saw that in the profile. So anyway, that's our reference point. When we run this model, what do we get? I am going to zoom in at the emergency valve again in um, zoom in at one point in space with a um, with it with the pressure tracking all the time. Sorry, how to gain my thoughts there. So what I can do again to reiterate, I am looking at the very inlet of this valve. How does the pressure change over time? Okay, it goes really high. According to ASME B314, a pressure surge should not go above 10% of my, should not go 10% above my design pressure. So my design pressure for this case, I just know this from my um, example, is the design pressure of the pipeline, 700 pounds, okay? That means my surge cannot go above 770 pounds because 10% 700 is 70. Add that on top of your design pressure. 770 is what you get. I can actually put this into the software as a design alert 
to let me know when that pressure is violated. So if I look at tools, design alerts, this is just a um, very broad way of saying, hey, some threshold was surpassed, warn me. So the threshold I'm concerned about is a pressure above 770 pounds, and I want to apply it to everywhere in the model, all of the pipes. I want to not get above 770. And let's see uh, in our output if that's true. Well, we can already see here it's not true, right? We go well above it right here. We go all the way up to 830-ish, 830. It warns us actually in the output itself um, when we run it. All of these purple messages come up that, oh, the pressure's above, 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 above. This is why I called it the bad valve closure because we're not meeting our design requirements or meeting our design alerts. And it's from closing this valve too quickly. Now, you as an engineer have to use, you gotta use your brain, you gotta use your brain. How, how then can I close this valve to make it not so bad? That requires you to understand the valve itself. So what we can do is plot the valve CV versus open percent and how it's controlling flow. So here is that ball valve we're talking about where it drops CV quickly, relatively quickly, uh, quickly and then flattens out right over time. And then my blue line here is open percentage. So my open percent is linear, but my flow control is not. Cool. What I have down here is how the, the flow rate is responding to that valve closure. Let me ask you something. Is the flow rate changing that much for the first couple seconds? I'll tell you the answer. The answer is no, it's not. So it's not even until my valve is about 40% open or 60% closed that it's starting to control the flow rate. That's because this is a large ball valve 10,000 CV where my steady state pressure drop across that valve was like 0 0.05 PSID because it's an emergency valve. I don't want it to cause a lot of resistance in my pipeline. Um, I, only, I only want to use it in emergencies. So during steady flow, no pressure drop. But by having such a high CV, that means it takes forever to actually, forever, relatively long to actually control the flow, right? So it doesn't actually control the flow until it gets to a CV of about 4,000. You can see that on the purple axis on my left or the purple box or about a 40% opening or uh, positioning, which you can see on the purple box uh, on the right. So what I can do as an engineer is say, oh, well, maybe I can close this valve in two stages where I get to 40% open very quickly. Because guess what? It ain't doing anything to the system. It's not really changing the flow rate. Most of the pressure loss is from friction of the pipe, not from a valve. So why not get to that, clo that more closed position quickly and then extend the closure for a few more seconds after that? Because right now our effective closure time, that's a term we use, is from about three seconds to five seconds. So although my valve is technically closing over five seconds, it's not actually doing a controlled closure um, over that. It's doing it over more like two seconds. So the system is seeing it as a faster valve closure. And I want to smooth that out. So what I can do is then, again, create a new scenario that I call a good valve closure. It's a good, well-behaved valve. Um, same system. Nothing is different except my valve actuation. <clears throat> What I'm doing now, as in a very exaggerated case, how fast you can close a valve totally depends on um, you know, your own limitations. But as an exaggeration, I'm going to close the valve 60% of the way in a tenth of a second. I am just going to, I'm going to use the word slam, but it's not like it's causing pressure rise. I'm going to slam this valve closed. Uh, I'm going to slam this valve to 40% open quickly in a tenth of a second. And then the rest of the closure, I'm going to extend for 15 seconds. So what it looks like is I'm closing to 40% very quickly because 
It's not controlling flow, at least not that much during that time. And then when it's really controlling flow is when I want to extend it out. So this is how you could do it in uh, two stages as you are just as a user defining the actuation of fully open to semi-open or to partially open to then fully closed, right? Now, the results of this, based on the name, what are they gonna be? They're gonna be good, they're gonna be good results. So let's look at valve pressure. Again, we have, oh, sorry, let's go to output. No design alerts exist, which means I ha I'm not above 770. That means I've met my ASME code. Now let's check what it actually looks like, the results, right? So I have valve pressure here, where it's again the inlet of the valve. I get to a maximum of about uh, 746 or so. Of course, you would want to run different sensitivities again, because that's still somewhat close to 770. Um, you can test different closures over 30 seconds, you know. But in this case, this is at least, you know, the minimum we need to do uh, is just extend that closure and close it much faster at the beginning, okay? And in case you're uh, wondering, I didn't mention this with the other graph, but we have a pressure spike and then we have more pressure rise after the spike. That is line pack. That is pressure on pressure. That's a pressure rise from valves plus frictional recovery, um, which is why it just takes a long time because it's a long pipeline. Anyway, that's why you kind of see it continue to go up. In this case, we have not surpassed our design alert. Awesome. Let's look at what our valve did. So here's that closure. Remember, I closed it very quickly to 40% open, extended it way longer out. Look at my flow over time now. It's no longer just a sudden waterfall. Waterfall. It is more smooth over time, causing much less severe surge because I can control it in two stages like this. So let's compare the uh, max pressure profiles of these two scenarios. So now, take a step back. What we're looking at is now a graph with length as the x-axis, where this is the entire pipeline, okay? And showing not the steady state pressure, but the max pressure seen in the system. So the maximum, which you can think about as pressure waves, just riding that line and then coming back, and riding that line, coming back. Um, in the two scenarios, right, I get um, from about 830 pounds to 740 pounds. That's a really, that's a much more preferable closure. I can see my maximum pressure at any point in my pipe stays below my 770 uh, pound design alert, right? So this is how you can incorporate the code into your modeling. Cool. All right, so be smart with sectioning. That might have seemed uh, a little random, but I wanted to throw it in there because it's part of the um, example blog I have, but also um, it's important when dealing with pipelines. And I know a lot of people out there are doing surge with pipelines. Understanding sectioning is very valuable. How do you actually understand it? You're not gonna learn it from this webinar because I went entirely too quickly, but we do have another webinar called Improving Water Hammer Analysis Runtimes uh, on our library, Improving Impulse Runtime. Here, that goes all through that. So I like to promote other blogs or uh, other resources we have because um, they're very valuable. There's a link there. You can't click the link, but uh, there should be a link in the email after the webinar or ask me. I'm happy to send you the link. Okay, we can put in, we oh, in this model, we put in the design layer 770. There is similarly a blog for that that I go through in a very similar way. Um, it's just now written. And the case is a little different, but it's called Know Your Surge Codes and Use AFT Impulse. It's a blog on our website. There's the link. Cool. So we exceeded this design alert when closing the valve in five seconds. Oh, but it behaved when closing the valve in 15 seconds in two stages because we, we got to the controlling CV as soon as possible, then extended the closure. All right. So we went from about 825 or 830 pounds to 745 maximum much more preferable so here's what that looks like um, these graphs side by side with multi-scenario graphing is i put in this line as a design alert you can see one is met and the other one's not okay. and here are the two uh, valve closures side by side again where we had um, a much faster effective closure time this waterfall when we just closed it in five seconds versus 
here where it's a much more smooth decline when we did a two-stage approach. Okay, conclusion. Use AFT impulse to model your valve closures. Uh, best practice to run several scenarios within the software to find the best solution. That's the beauty of software. Test many things. You can leverage design alerts to warn you when a parameter threshold has been breached. And you can tie components together with control logic. And it can be very uh, complex. Not, I don't want to make it sound intimidating. What I mean is it, it's, um, it's a very sophisticated kind of logic you can do with different components. Uh, take valve characteristics into account, which is that CV versus open percent graph. Oh, oh, another plug. We have that webinar coming up called The Importance of Valve Inherent Characteristics for Water Hammer Analysis. This is the one I mentioned that might already be out by the time you're watching this webinar. But in any case, look out for that name. Um, here's the link. Uh, again, that's the sign up link. So depending on where in time you are that is a good link or not, but find that, you can find that title regardless. And this is what the sign-up sheet will look like when you go to watch the recording, that will just be a YouTube video. So, thank you. Please uh, feel free to contact us. Here's the contact info. I'll leave it up for a minute if you wanna write it down. Um, yeah, exciting stuff, closing valves. Hopefully you learned a lot. Feel free to shoot me an email. Uh, either these here, or if you know me personally, you can shoot me an email. I'm happy to discuss more. If you have any questions, feel free to reach out. So thank you guys very much. Appreciate your time.